Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to read a little bit more from our book that we're reading together, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. And as you know, we're on chapter 5 still, it's quite a long chapter. We're on page 94. Um, new subtitle is called Dr. Stewart's Important Contribution. In the human, the demolition of the safe, quote-unquote safe, threshold idea for radiation is infinitely more devastating. We owe this contribution to humanity to the works of Dr. Alice Stewart and her collaborators in England. Her studies, first published in 1956, deal with the effect of diagnostic radiation of pregnant women, which, of course, also means radiation of the fetus in utero. The amount of radiation, in parentheses, of X-rays no different from the ionizing radiation of atomic energy activities, close parentheses, to the infant in such examination is only two rads per average examination. And Dr. Stewart found that children who had been radiated in utero had a 50% increase in the number of cases of cancer in various forms, as well as leukemias, during the first 10 years of life. This represents an enormous sensitivity to radiation, far more serious than even the pessimists had anticipated. Considering the shattering impact of Dr. Stewart's work, it is not at all surprising that the atomic energy promoters and the radiologists scoffed at the findings and dismissed them. But Dr. Stewart persisted in her important researches, abundantly confirming her earlier findings. Not long after, Professor Brian McMahon confirmed her work in the United States, and most recently, Dr. Stewart has presented an even more damning evidence. By careful study of thousands of cases of childhood cancer and leukemia, and counting the number of x-ray pictures taken during the pregnancy, she found that one and a half rads doubles the frequency of childhood cancer or leukemia if the pictures were taken in the latter half of pregnancy. Wow! If taken during the first three months of the pregnancy, only one-third of a rad is required to double the frequency of cancer or leukemia in the offspring during the first 10 years of life. I'm going to read that again. If taken during the first three months of pregnancy, only one-third of a rad is required to double the frequency of cancer or leukemia in the offspring during the first 10 years of life. And one-third of a rad is a long way from the hundred rads the AEC promoters are so fond of speaking of still as the lowest dose where evidence of cancer is seen in human beings due to radiation. For those who wonder why the Atomic Energy Commission promoters are so refractory to allowing this important new knowledge to diffuse into their brains, it requires the reminder that shattering one's fondest hopes come hard, no matter what the truth be. The idea that a safe threshold of radiation must exist, even if it doesn't, appears glued to the brains of atomic energy promoters with the strength of epoxy glue. And perhaps with the known strength of epoxy, such promoters, such promoters fear removal of this, quote, fond hope, unquote, may take too much brain with it. Fuck. Yeah, they're smoking fucking glue. That's what they're doing. Uh, prof new, new subtitle. Professor Radford attacks the, quote, safe, unquote, threshold concept. The reader may find it incredible that the refractoriness of the AEC and its supporters of the Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy could be so extreme. Examine the record. When Goffman and Tamplin presented evidence to the Senate Subcommittee on Air and Water Pollution, evidence that, 
quote, safe, unquote, threshold concepts had no support in scientific evidence. Do you hear that? Evidence that the safe threshold concept had no support in scientific evidence. The Atomic Energy Commission promptly replied to Senator Edmund Muskie that Goffman and Tamplin were wrong because they had failed to take into account that a threshold existed below the radiation dosage could not produce cancer. What? The heady drink of $2.5 billion budget still was making the AEC staff see the little man who wasn't there. So what he's saying here is that they basically lied. The AEC lied directly to the Senate. Let's read that again. I'm sorry, but I got to read that again. The reader may find it incredible that the, that the refractoriness of the AEC and its supporters in the Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy could be so extreme. Examine the record. When Goffman and Tamplin presented evidence to the Senate Subcommittee on Air and Water Pollution, presented evidence to the Senate Subcommittee on Air and Water Pollution, Evidence that safe threshold concepts had no support in scientific evidence. The Atomic Energy Commission promptly replied to Senator Ed, Edmund Muskie that Goffman and Tamplin were wrong because they had failed to take into account that a threshold existed below which radiation dosage could not produce cancer. They just said there was no scientific evidence. The heady drink of a $2.5 billion budget was still making the AEC staff see the little man who wasn't there. Soon thereafter, at hearings on the Joint Committee of Atomic Energy, Professor Edward Radford of John Hopkins University expressed his indignation that the AEC should seek shelter in the safe threshold concept when the International Commission and the Federal Radiation Council both have rejected it as being an unprovable concept with respect to protection of the public health. Dr. Rafford told the Joint Committee that the AEC seeking shelter behind the so-called safe threshold meant a reversal of everything sound biologically with respect to such environmental pollutants as radiation emitting substances that have never won that have never been won over a period of years. No doubt the vast majority of knowledgeable biological scientists with a concern for humanity would have seconded Dr. Professor Radford's comments vigorously. Wow. <clears throat> Dr. Radford told the Joint Committee that the AEC seeking shelter behind the so-called safe threshold meant a reversal of everything sound biologically with respect to such environmental pollutants as radiation emitting substances that had never been won over a period of years. Wow. Congressman Chad Holifield, chairman of the Joint Committee, knew precisely what Professor Radford was saying. The AEC's duplicity was on the record. And Chairman Holifield said explicitly in a measured voice, the AEC will follow the ground rules set down by the FRC and ICRP. The conservative ground rules meaning no reliance on little men who may be there or a safe threshold. New subtitle, the AEC does an about face. <clears throat> the Atomic Energy Commission was on the spot. Their staff made themselves ridiculous in the unseemly haste to criticize Goffman and Tamplin and had thereby raised a storm over an issue that they could not possibly defend ever. So they promptly reversed themselves, saying, We were not aware of any standards of radiation exposure that has ever been set assuming a, quote, safe amount of radiation. These words were slightly changed, but they were now in effect 
eating their previous words in print because they were caught with both hands in the cookie jar. On March 4, 1970, in a city council chamber in New York, Councilman Theodore Weiss looked squarely at Dr. William Burr, Associate Director of the AEC Division of Biology and Medicine, and asked, Do you assume a safe threshold of radiation for cancer and leukemia production? And Dr. Burr said, I know of no standard-setting body that assumes safe standard threshold of radiation for cancer production. Dr. Burr was now saying, in effect, every amount of radiation should be considered to produce its proportionate share of cancers and leukemia. How very interesting. Caught in the vice between the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and Professor Radford's direct challenge, the AEC had reversed its field completely. But the promoter never forgets what is best for promotion, and the AEC repentance was quite short. Losing the crutch of a safe threshold that could be used for false reassurance of an anxious public seemed too, far too big a loss for the AEC. And thus, two short weeks after Dr. Burr said he knew, uh, we know of no counting of a th safe threshold, Dr. Glenn Seaborg, chairman of the AEC, ap appeared on CBS Morning News television show. Joseph Benty, the CBS newsman, asked, Do you consider there is any safe threshold amount of radiation? And Dr. Seaborg replied, We believe there is a low threshold. Flip-flop, flip-flop. This time, Professor Radford wasn't watching, and the statement slipped by unchallenged. How long is the American public expected to tolerate this behavior on such an important issue? Well, I guess it's been fucking 50 years, sir. <clears throat> For public health purposes, there is only one way to deal with a question like, is there any safe threshold amount of radiation below which cancer doesn't occur? Either we know positively and beyond a reasonable doubt that such a threshold exists, and then we can relax about doses below the level. Or we don't know anything at all about a possible safe threshold. Suppose we have a situation. <clears throat> Thus, suppose under a circumstance of no such threshold, one calculates 32,000 extra persons will die annually of cancer and leukemia if exposed to a particular dose of radiation. On the other hand, if a threshold exists above some particular dose of radiation, there would be zero similar deaths annually. So the decision lies between zero and 32,000 deaths. And let us suppose nothing allows us enough insight to choose between these two extremes, or any number in between. What number should we assume for planning purposes in a technological enterprise? Historically and up to today, promoters like the Atomic Energy, Com Energy Commission hold on, assume the zero value and something very close to it, not because of malevolence, but because they hope it may be correct. Certainly it is the convenient choice which interferes least with selling the technology to the public. But under the circumstances described, Choosing zero and acting upon that choice represents irresponsibility of the highest order in the neglect of public health and safety. So I'm going to stop there. We're at 14 minutes. We're on page 98. The next subtitle is The Public Should Have the Right to Decide. Yeah, well, you know what they say. Shoulds don't work. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. We certainly need them. Ciao.